Hello and welcome to the Nausicast. The Nausicast is where we go through each movie made by Studio Ghibli in release order and we discuss our analysis and research findings. Uh, findings. Today, not so many research findings. Yet again, not a lot of academic papers written on this film. But it is the first cinematic release not directed by Takahata or Miyazaki because, you know, Ocean Waves was a TV exclusive film. Instead, it is directed by Yoshifumi, Yoshifumi Kondo and it's called Wisp of the Heart. With me today are Hipster Cthulhu. Uh, here I am again to defend my uh, most co host appearances. And Clayton was Clayton sneaking Skull. up on me. Exactly. And he's still sneaking yeah. up on you. He's no. still here. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's me. I was I was about to make a joke with country roads, but like I uh, don't really have one. How unfortunate! And as always, if you don't watch the video, want to watch the video version on YouTube, we always provide a download link in the description. And as a little piece of news, well, not really news, half news, we might be looking into getting this podcast on iTunes and all the other you know favorite podcast apps that people have. Uh, that, but that's a work in progress. We still need to figure that out. But Maybe the next one will be released on multiple platforms at once. Okay, so Wisp of the Heart. It's a 1990 film, uh, 1999 film that was screened alongside On Your Mark. We already talked uh, a little uh, bit. 99, I think. I think you misspoke. 95. Yeah. Okay, I misspoke. Damn. Released in 1995 and screened alongside On Your Mark. It, uh, uh, as we always said in the On Your Mark cast, which you can check out on this channel. Uh, <laughs> um, it, on your mark was basically a pre-run feature before the film. Is that what it's called? Yeah, it's a, it, yeah. It, it's a, yeah, it, it's a short b before the like main yeah. feature. Yeah. And Whisper of the Heart is based on a shoujo manga by Aoi Hiragi. And just as a little interesting context, there's in fact a sequel manga which plays two years after the events of the film, and a live action sequel. As is in the making as we speak, has been announced this year, a live action sequel to Wisp of the Heart. Not that this is going to be having much of an impact on uh, how we talk about the film, but I found it quite interesting that we are very much right on time with our coverage of this film. So this is uh, the first uh, like theatrically uh, released uh, Studio Ghibli film that is not directed by like the two uh, big guys, Miyazaki or Takahata. Yeah, but instead by Yoshifumi Kondo. But to be fair, he's been working alongside the crew uh, uh, for a long, long time. Um, they met, so uh, Miyazaki, Takahara, and Kondo met uh, while working on Lupin the Third, and then continued to work together on other work like um, Panda Go Panda, uh, Anne of the Green Gables, Sherlock Hound, Kiki's Delivery Service, Only Yesterday, Graves of the Fireflies, Princess Mononoke, and so on and so on. And uh, going way back also on Miyazaki's Future Boy Conan. So, as you can see, they have a long and shared career where Kondo has often had the role of character designer and animation director on these works. And, you know, it is arguable, at the very least, if you look at the early design documents for uh, Panda Copanda, which was, by the way, first intended to be a Pippi Longstockings adaptation, a uh, <laughs> little-known fact. Hmm, that's um, pretty interesting. Yeah, and, and like they, they went to Sweden and they talked to the original author and she rejected it. So sad. But uh, they repurposed. Going, yeah. yeah. And they repurposed the original design work into Panda Go Panda. Uh, but my point is that you can see in this design work, which is a Yoshifumi Kondo design, like the early onset of like the Ghibli girl face, which is so relevant, I think, for like the Ghibli films. Like we always talk about Ghibli girls. And I think it's kind of interesting to ponder that. Kondo might have a non-unsignificant role in developing how this look even uh, seems like like th what the yeah, Ghibli like the, 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 the Ghibli yeah. face is like his character design sensibility is what you're uh, getting at. Maybe I mean it is clear to me that Miyazaki's manga also has this kind of face constantly. So it is not entirely evident to me whether or not it's like them working together on the designs of like Miyazaki being like the older guy who's like taken care of Kondo for a long time of his career and taught him a lot of things has influenced his style significantly of like. Kondo was actually coining it first. I couldn't tell you because it's also kind yeah, of hard to really trace. It's a, it's a cre creative co collaboration. It's uh, like there's there's no clear place like things originate, but like obviously 
Kondo was an important member of like the creative team on like almost every one yeah. of uh, Studio Ghibli's works uh, and almost every one of Miyazaki and Takahata's works. Um, he is he has also been widely called the right hand of Miyazaki because you know working together on animation is basically um but, uh, those he two. Was, he was the the junior, right? Yeah, he was the junior. So, so he's uh, ten yeah. years younger than Miyazaki. Yeah, About so about like 10 they, years. they they were th- this like this being his first like uh, feature film to like d- director uh, credit uh, is is like um, it, he he was essentially as I understand it me- meant to like uh, be the successor to Miyazaki because like yeah obviously Miyazaki couldn't work forever and like yeah. it, this is like a few years before. Uh, Miyazaki starts the whole I'm retiring now and I mean it uh, with exactly. now I mean it, uh, <laughs> the game, <laughs> the game of, of retiring of his career. Yeah, yeah exactly Yeah, it seems that Takahata and Miyazaki were very interested in finding the next generation of, of directors for Studio Ghibli Yeah, because at the time Miyazaki was like almost 60 and I guess, I guess at the time he was still thinking of both maybe retiring at a normal age like 65 or something you know who knows but uh, as it turns out well this <laughs> didn't happen <laughs> yeah, yeah but yeah Kondo was his like main candidate for whom he wanted to inherit this role like r- very explicitly so yeah and you can you can definitely see why you can definitely tell he was clearly a successor because Miyazaki basically set this movie up to be Kondo's thing where Miyazaki wrote the script and like did a lot of the most most of the designs and he even did a lot of the storyboarding so even some of like the the director's typical duties were taken over by Miyazaki, as him like handing the torch to Kondo. Yeah, but it didn't become a, a Kiki's Delivery Service situation where like he just like ended up taking over because it made more sense at that point. Uh, like it, it's it's still uh, Kondo's name on it. Um, yeah, and I think you can feel a lot of the uniqueness to this film that like doesn't come across as like specifically Miyazaki's work. Yeah, uh, like for 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 one, it like it's very, uh, it's really really grounded. Like you you look at the poster, yeah. and uh, and you see oh, there's this like uh, she's in a like red dress, and there's this uh, cats wearing a wearing a suit, and they're flying through this magical world yeah. of like bright skies and gemstones. I wonder what sort of imaginative world we're going to enter into in this new Studio Ghibli feature film. And it's mostly a like uh like adolescent romance about a girl who wants to like find something to do because she's fallen in love with a creative yeah. guy. That's but it. that isn't to say that the wonderful like surreal backdrop that you just described that doesn't show up in the film and it, indeed it does and that's highly interesting while we're talking on the production and stuff for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that these backgrounds, like the, the the fantasy scene sequences of Shizuku's story and the Baron and so on, are drawn by the artist uh, Naohisa Inoue, which, uh, who is a relatively famous uh, impressionist surrealist painter in Japan. So not like someone who's like an anime uh, uh, artist or background artist or whatever, but actually like like a... I think also professor at some like design academy in uh, in Japan, but also very very big name, big important name, and these um, surreal backgrounds are like chosen by Miyazaki after having encountered the art by Inoue. And uh, fun fact, like like just as a how should I put it, just as a teaser for a future episode, there's a short film called Ibla Jikan released by uh, Studio Ghibli as well, and. Iblad is the name of Inoue's fantasy world that this scene technically also takes place in that happens in this film. So uh, Inoue's entire body of work consists of drawing these surreal landscapes uh, in G- uh, in Iblad, which is his like, main thing. So he, this artist, then directed Iblad Jikan much later together with Studio Ghibli, which is when we're going to talk about that more. Wow, I, uh, I didn't realize, but like you can definitely tell that it's like something completely different going on in those backgrounds. Like the way, oh, yeah. like it, it's all abstract watercoloring, like making this strange world where everything feels like di- distant, like in a dream, and like filled with like everything's made of gemstones and stuff. Like and, and, it, it's yeah. a pre- pretty impress- impressive couple of sequences uh, we got there. 
Okay, yeah, it also yeah. fits in with the whole like Studio Ghibli identity, where even these movies set in realistic circumstances with realistic characters, like uh, like we saw with Takahata's work with Fireflies or Only Yesterday. They still kind of just have to put in these little bits of like fantasy, where the characters are doing something impossible, and that you know, you could only show through animation, just to kind of like just to kind of have that wonder to all of their works as a as a consistent mm. element. But, yeah, but like I, I always uh, always find it interesting when uh, looking at animated works, especially realistic ones, to, to like ask the question, why was this animated? Like, what mm-hmm. does that add or subtract that's significant? And and like obviously, like Studio Ghibli, there's always there's almost always a reason. I think uh, I think Ocean Waves might be like the the least interesting in that department. Um, but yeah, yeah, probably. So. I have actually have an interesting read on that kind of pain things. And I think while we're on it, maybe I can get a little into it. Because the interesting element of these of this surreal style is that it is interesting enough, like all the landscape and nature and city parts meld into like weird shapes that form new like skyscrapers. So if you like really zoom in on like the skyscrapers in these scenes, it's always like an amalgamation of like houses and roads and trees and so on stretching together to form these new constructs or like little flying islands, which are con- entirely consisting of, of like a me- melting pot of nature and um, um, trees and roads and, uh, and, and houses. And I couldn't help but notice that there's like this embodies kind of the approach to nature in the entire film. Because when we see Shizuku following the cat and like getting lost in this urban sprawl, which was formerly like Tama Hills, the nat- nature like site that we visited in the Pompoko cast, by the way, check out the Pompoko cast if you haven't, uh, where we talk more about Tama Hills which was formerly like an entire natural region that was like urbanized in an incredibly fast process. Like the idea that I have is in this film, we encounter a different kind of curious and magical nature that is entirely like rooted in the urban space. And as the urban space and nature melt into these constructs, as they do in this surreal painting, this is kind of the space we're exploring. Similar to how Totoro happens, right? When the kids play outside, the little like Totoros show up and they follow them into like the the true like narrow winding path. They follow them into the nature that which is inhabited by like interesting things and adventure and uh, uh, and like the big Totoro. In this film, it's following a cat into like the hidden parts of the city that you don't see, the ones that feel like. Uh, natural and as if they had grown and if they like intermingled and you find a very magical shop at the end of it I think that has a very similar feeling to it which is really strongly embodied by this kind of background art as well yeah it comes through to this whole like fairy tale motif that we can explain more on that's like the reoccurring plot elements but yeah I feel like the background work is really good but not just the fantasy ones but all the backgrounds just within the normal world really feel unique for Ghibli and really feel like maybe this is Kondo's specific kind of aesthetic and idea that feels totally unique from Takahata and Miyazaki because it's a true like love and beauty of the cityscape because as we talked about in previous works like Takahata and Miyazaki don't really have love for like the urban sprawl or like more populated areas they always like to go away from them or at least critically show them like they're all these like bold cold geometric buildings but the whole cityscape of like the outskirts of tokyo and she takes the train in it's like shown with like the most like beauty and care it's always framed like it's a fantasy like she's always going over some impossibly steep hill and everything's rising up in the distance to meet her like the sun's always hitting the buildings in the most like a uh, beautiful way possible yeah so there's adventure this, around like, the corner it's this fantasy setting almost of like there is a beauty to the city. There is like, uh, it's not all bad. You know, there's people within it. There's like magic still there. There's these little adventures you can still go on if you look for it. And that's kind of what the yeah. cat does. Yeah I, th- yeah, I think it's it's one of the like best things about the movie. And like the, it, it might actually like be what something that, uh, as you say, sets Kondo apart from uh, from the other directors uh, is, is like th- this sense of like, the sense of space and of like uh, and place and physicality and uh, and and everything is like tactile and lived in um, and and like the whole like uh, animation is very concerned with um, with location direction like and the everyday uh, movement around uh, this uh, particular part of uh, of West Tokyo 
um, and as you say, like the opening scene is this, uh, sh- sh- like showing the um, the geography, the 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 character of uh, the uh, Tama Hills area it takes place in with the tr- with the train station at night um, as the, uh, the country roads uh, cover place, um, and 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 we get to like get a feel of like okay, so there are these houses up on the hills looking out over this area. This the central uh, train station from where we see the main character walk uh, up some hills to get uh, to get to her home. Um, and, and later on, like, we get, like, really, like, a uh, clear sense of, like, how her, her walk to school is, what it's like to get to the library. And then, of course, we have the, uh, the, the scene you mentioned where she follows the cat. And again, it's, like, very particular about, uh, like... Space. Where the cat goes, yeah. how she follows it, and and the places she has to go around, the little nooks and crannies. Uh, yeah, they love so, yeah. love it. It's like in this scene, uh, the entire chase of the cat. You are constantly going through like narrow passageways to enter a new realm. Basically, the first time is when she leaves the train station. You have the narrow exit of the train station, like very very wonderfully framed where you really follow with the camera as she exits like the narrow pathway and the city opens itself then like there's this one door then there's this one like narrow like uh thing the cat walks through where you already have like earth underground every time a new like facet a new position in the space is revealed as it gradually gets more mystical as as she goes through these narrow passageways following the cat it, it, it's yeah, really well directed right about how it's uh it's like there's the sense of space and positioning to everything is so well felt because you go like directly up the hill from the library and then like you turn to around, around where the house is and, like you feel like you're almost there because it's so realized just the way that it curves down on the slope and then the house has like overlooking it because mm. even as she's originally coming up the hill and the first time we see it we can already see the house on the hill it's like already there it also really helps that she up sometimes loses the cat while she's following the cat and is looking around and like trying to find the cat again. So like we really get like the orientation around the place too. I found that was very clever. Like as the cat gets lost, we have these panning shots of like everything and the establishing like shots, like not zoning in on the on the, the cat, but for the first time realizing where she is. The interesting thing is like she gets completely lost, right? She wouldn't know where she is if if she yeah. wasn't told where the library is. She got completely lost by following the cat, which is again like like in Totoro, like getting lost in the woods basically. Like <laughs> Yeah, um I also like this is a bit of a side note, but like first time I watched this movie, I didn't really know much about it. Like I, I knew the posters, I knew like it was more realism than fantasy. But like okay, um, like I was sort of waiting for this to be the Alice in Wonderland moment where she follows the cat and oh, yeah. like somehow like enters this realm that maybe it's her imagination, maybe it's real, and that's going to be like the whole we're going to switch between them. But like yeah, turns I- out, nope. It's, it, 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 she actually turns up in an actual boutique but like the way it's set up is like in order to get us into this mindset of her being on this adventure and like obviously she's like at, the, at this point in the story she's kind of like aimless ki- kind of bored just reading uh, stories getting absorbed in them and like oh, oh and she's so excited to like have her own little story and what she finds is this magical shop with this like captivating little doll of a of, of a the, the the baron yeah the cat um, but the baron yeah and, and she meets this kindly grandfather who show who shows us this uh, amazing mm. uh clockwork uh w- with a fairy tale in it and she yeah. like imprints on this that like oh this is like the magical place um, yeah so it is an alice in wonderland moment she yeah, ended yeah. up in a sort of wonderland for her she found but an adventure real, yeah. but but the funny thing is like she at, at this point she finds not only an adventure like a myth, mystical place full of magic and fairy tales but also like looking out over the city over the hills which is like this space with like the little balcony where you where, where she and 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 and, and the, the guy i forgot his name right now look out over the city that as well it's like her finding the future in a sense so yeah, it is such good, a yeah. such a transformative moment when she finds this place and it's really really cool also tying back into like the fairy tale cycle thing this is where we're, we're introduced to kind of the first part of this with the uh, the clock because you know like by chance uh, the old man at the shop is fixing the clock at this very moment and then we get this elaborate, like insanely detailed little clockwork thing that shows the dwarf a king and the the fairy princess and their like tragic separation, which will become like a a reoccurring thing in the plot where we learn about the old man's backstory being of a similar nature 
and then of course kind of a uh a, a half similar to how Shizuku and uh uh k g are as well where they're like slightly separated over the uh the little end portion of the movie yeah, which which also ties into like an ongoing uh, theme in it about like imagination and inspiration and creativity um that, like it's not it's not actually a coincidence that like th- though that she's drawn to that story and like the story she writes later has to do, like it is the same theme and like her like romance with the with the boy is uh, has the similar theme uh, i think it's really interesting but um uh, but b- before we get to any of that I, I want to get back to this idea of like the uh, the physical space as such a like important part of the film and i think like it's the like, condo style yeah it's the kind of condo style but like uh, we, we we get it from Yasaki as well um but whereas uh l- like um like 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 for instance uh, in Kiki's delivery service the house they live in like you understand exactly like where things are there you could walk around in that if that existed um and of course we'll get to spirited away later which is just amazing in that regard but i think what what really sets uh, this film apart is again how grounded it is like everything is like actual believable geography whereas like in Kiki's delivery service you had this absolutely impossible pseudo european pseudo nordic uh city that's just like like w- goes all in but like here it's uh, it's it's also so grounded and i think that uh, it's it, it's such an important part of the movie it's not just a flourish because it it kind of ties the whole thing together i think there's a i think there's an ongoing thing in this movie about the uh like the border between that I- I- imagination the the fantasy and like the tactile reality so we have uh, again this scene where alice in wonder like uh, land ish she walks into this magical place and it's like introduced to like uh, oh this is a place of fairy tales and of uh, escape from uh, the the mm. mundane later she tries to return to the place but in but but like at that point it's closed it's an actual shop with a person in it uh, who runs it like it's it's not this magical like wonderland in reality but that doesn't when, take long to turn back into one <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah but 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 at this but uh, it turns into one like um or, or kind of organically because that's when we have the scene where uh, she she meets KG again and he's like oh you you want to you want to come in and i i just love the scene where he he like takes her to like uh, a side uh, door like into like the oh, yeah. uh, into like the back down the stairs to like the back door slash cellar room hmm. and by the way same like, motif right the narrow yeah. passageway into like the opening of the horizon right there oh yeah uh, but but uh, I, th- I think it's really cool how at once it it pay it first of all it pays off the whole thing with all the hi- the impossibly steep hills almost uh, with this view which makes totally geographical sense like why wouldn't there be this wonderful view from up here and we even like subtly established it in like the introductory scene we even see the cat uh, at the balcony so if you rewatch it you you definitely notice that at the very start but also. The way it turns the shop from this magical place that has to be like open for you to like just a physical space with like there's a cellar where there's people who do stuff down there. There's there's this whole um, it it becomes like immediately more tactile, more human. Um, There's there's, like small little details about it, Uh, like like the way the um, KG like says, oh by the way. you can turn off the lights if you want. It's over here. It's it it, it just like um, this transition from this whoa strange escapist place to, to like a physical location, um, yeah. and, and w- which she then like has to, like sort of conjures into magic again through uh, the story she writes. Uh, although at that point, there's also the way she like researches these gems. Uh, which like it become a like symbol and is presented to her as this magical thing, this metaphor. But she goes to like research them actually, like what are these physically, uh, in order to turn them back in, uh, into magic in that way. I, I think I think it's a really interesting like uh, ongoing motif uh, in the film, and it, yeah. and it ties like into the way the animation and and this uh, location works. 
Oh yeah, there's totally an, a sense in which the writer here is kind of against kind of the property of m turning the mundane into the magical and the magical turns back into the mundane as we experience the, the real life experience. But then we, we to find like some purpose and direction in our life, we turn it into the magical again. Like this is like pervasive throughout the entire film, I think, yeah. Yeah, it goes back to uh, the reflection I was saying of between the like the fairy tales and the real world parallels. Or, like, yeah. They're, they're 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 imagining these like um like heartbreaking fairy tales, but then it's like stuff like this has actually happened to the characters, and it's kind of seeing a reflection in them. And then she kind of like she incidentally had that in her work and not even realizing it. So it's almost oh, yeah. like the border between like uh fantasy and reality, and the way that the writer can kind of capture something that's like both incredibly fantastical and real. Yeah, but but like it's 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 not a coincidence. Like she's both like inspired by the fairy tale in the clockwork and by like uh, the, her developing relationship with uh, Keiji, which all mm -hmm. like re re yeah. reflects the, uh, the the grandfather's previous experience. Seiji, by the way. <laughs> Keiji. Seiji. Se Seiji. Seiji. Yeah, Seiji oh, is his name. Okay. Oh, that's totally my bad. Um, <laughs> okay. Not a big problem. <laughs> I, I remember, yeah, Se Seiji. Um, I, I think, like, in, in terms of, like, the animation and location, I think there's also, like, a huge focus on the everyday uh, and, like, how that forms uh, the, the world and the characters. Like, uh, like the beginning half of the film has a lot of, like, again, her going to school, uh, making lunches, like, cleaning up after herself, uh, the, the, the sister doing the laundry, uh, stuff like that is, like really like deliberately shown as like part of these characters world because they want to establish not just like the normal world in like uh, in terms of like screenwriting principles but also like how like mundane it is and there's uh, the, the the film is in a way about the transition into like something less uh, automatic less everyday um which I also find a uh, really interesting well, the reason I think it shows all this mundane stuff is again kind of part of th that comes into the highlighting of the uh, the artistic process, where yeah, work. Um, it has this this fantastical element to it all, but also yeah, it shows it like as work. It shows that uh, she makes sacrifices to continue to work, and that like that that's kind of like becomes her everyday thing, which is kind of a good parallel for animation, because um. Like animation itself, it's this fantastical, like joyous thing where we see it on the screen. But like, it's hours upon hours upon hours of just drawing the same image, but then just slightly different. And so it's just this repeated yeah. grind of this work. And it kind yeah. of like highlights uh, that feel to it. There's such a wonderful parallel here because in the beginning of the movie we have the scene where the big sister says, "Hey, bring your father the lunch," and she and and, and she's of course like, "No, I don't want to." Okay, would you rather do the household work and vacuum and wash the clothes and everything? Would you rather do it? And she's like, nope. And just then she's out there. But as she's out there, she has kind of the freedom to experience adventures. So at the start of the film, she's a sort of directionist. So she just, you know, while bringing the lunch somewhere, she doesn't really take it so seriously. She takes a huge detour, like experiences all these little adventures while her sister is there toiling away. And by the end of the film, Shizuku turns into someone who takes her work so seriously that she like neglects other things in life. Yeah. Like, And this is so interesting when we talk about art because we know the inciting moment into becoming an artist, into finding this passion in her, was her finding this strange place, this magical place, this detour from like the childish intuition. But also in this film, like the moment happens where she decides that this is the thing she wants to do and that she's ready to do the work for it. And which is which really is just hard, hard work. She stops reading just fairy tales and starts reading like non-fiction books, reads up on cats to, you know, write the stuff. It, it's really emblematic of like the shift in seriousness she has from like the avoiding the the work that an everyday work that is necessary into suddenly taking it highly seriously. Yeah, and we'll de definitely get to uh, th that part and that central theme, like yeah. in her whole character arc. Uh, j just uh, while we're still like kind of talking about like uh, animation detail and stuff like that. Oh yes. Um, like some something I, I really noticed was uh, the, a lot of like parallax shots uh, in, mm. in this um, movie. There's especially a few shots from like when she's taking the train, 
and we see like from within the train you can see individual compartments moving mm, with the background really where several layers are moving as well it's really like like it's genuinely impressive um i'm not sure if there's like anything like that in uh, earlier ghibli yeah could I, n it doesn't immediately come to me. So there was a, a lot of impressive parallax in Pompoko too, but like the most impressive parallax in this film, or not really parallax, but the amount of moving objects on screen is in the in the fantasy sequences. Uh, and this is very appropriate to mention here, I believe, because in the fantasy sequences with all these little floating islands and the quick floating around, it, this is actually the first time that digital compositing was used in a Ghibli film to make possible this... Uh, this amount of movement where every bit of the scenery was still traditionally animated like on cells but then like scanned and digitally composed to make all these movements happen which is well as i said the first time it has been used in ghibli and since then pretty much in every film it's really interesting to like no, like you you, you notice a, a bit like oh that's impressive and i've seen that before and it turns out there's actually like some technological progress uh, going on yeah. that uh, that that explain it yeah, as we trace through this podcast, like we've talked about so many like te technological like developments that happened like between those films and how they impacted the film. Hey, and next time with Mononoko, we're also going to talk about a new one again, just as a little teaser. Like, <laughs> oh some yeah, I mean that, that's going to be a whole stuff, thing yeah. for like uh, exactly, what, like, yeah, the, the and, at, around the turn of the uh, century is where like uh, digital animation really starts coming into its own, especially yeah. in Japanese animation. And I think The Cat Returns is the first entirely digital film, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, we digress. Yeah. Um, but one last thing I, I want to make note of. Um, it, it's another thing where, where like, uh, I, I really love Studio Ghibli films because it's they're filled with these incidental things that are, are like, it, that somewhat at some point felt was important enough to painstakingly animate uh, and add into it. Um, like so, so sometimes it's little things like you mentioned how she got lost uh, up uh, up at like w when she found the uh, boutique yeah but and, and like that's that's a little really small line where she has to like uh, run because oh it's it's late and I have to meet, meet my dad uh, and and she starts running and the grandpa's like wait hang on uh, you have to go left to get to the library like it's such a little yeah. moment that didn't have to be there but it says so much be that it's it is important enough for like someone to be like, hey, she doesn't know where the library is. It's those parts that actually make yeah. it grounded. Well, and, and so and, that I, left yeah. to the library ends in with my uh, one of my favorite pieces of animation in the whole film. Just that little bit where she's running down the stairs and she kind of like swings on the pole that like goes down towards the left, and it's just it's so it's such a sharp little flare of like. Uh, like, because again, the movie is mostly realistically animated, and all the uh, the character animation is is mostly subtle. But then there's all these little moments of just uh, exaggeration that like gives gives life to it. And as she swings around, it feels like so natural. Also, now you mentioned it, like I uh, like I think like the first really impressive uh, animation cut to me was when she throws uh, the, the the like sports bag to uh, to, to to the guy uh, on the baseball team. Like the 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 way it's like shown, like the physicality of her, like uh, mm -hmm. throwing get, like, it and, and, and the back, it, yeah. like wobbling because it's made of cloth, and like him catching it. it yeah, th th there's a lot of like um, again, it's physicality stuff like that. I think one last thing I really wanted to mention was um, so uh, we 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 talk about how like it's the city, uh, and and that's an important part of the location's identity so almost every time that we're, we're at a road especially like uh, during the day something is driving by like, there's always like a, a little truck a car uh, a, a bike a motorcycle something like that uh, people always like look each way before cross crossing the road and like for a reason yeah like, except it, for shizuku it, it, it who gets run like over who gets yeah, almost run yeah, over like five times? Over. That one scene where <laughs> you can see you can see the driver's face, like the sheer p panic and terror on his face, <laughs> as he almost hit a, like an eight-year-old. <laughs> at been some a point, movie. at some point, we need to retrospect on like uh, irresponsible driving and irresponsible street crossing habits in Ghibli movies. It's not <laughs> a coincidence. It, I, I, it's I, everywhere. I think, uh, I think it in comes Ponyo. To in Ponyo, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be nuts. Um, yeah. But I, I just think that that's like like it goes such a long way in like emphasizing how this is a, this is still like a city 
like even with all the little bits of nature and stuff that is still a, a city where you have to like look everywhere where you, when you cross the road it's noisy at uh, at the road um, noisy. and it also creates this um this uh contrast with the uh the, the the neighborhood where the boutique is where it's like quiet and like almost yeah. no traffic except like a, a bike like, or two i like that you brought this up because we talked about how uh the, the space is established visually how the space is established like from like the coherence of like how we move through the spaces but the spaces are also heavily established orally in in one of the posts i've read actually there was a comparison which said that like you know miyazaki's uh, kind of scenes are usually designed like with a lot of movement and every like part of the scene like there's something going on and like you're often have like very crowded scenes because miyazaki has the style we talked about this in previous casts where he basically writes scene by scene and as he animates it it basically comes together for him but in in kondo's film here you have the sense that most of the scenes are like like little dioramas like little still places that are like characterized by sound and like uh, uh as much as every, anything else so when you hear like the faint sound of cars or like uh, uh raindrops or you know animals uh, that are in the vicinity and so on that that makes the scene about as much as like it does visually and the scenes are like self-contained like kind of yeah i said diorama and i think i stick by that because as we have like these scenes there's those are already laid out they're like not uh, unfolding like new scenes in front of us, but we have like a very still and very real world there. Uh, yeah, I think the scene with uh, the uh, the guy confessing to her, saying that like I really liked you instead of your friend. That scene in particular strikes me because we have this like big ray of light coming down on this little shrine that's like this shrouded tree area that's like somewhere in the middle of the city. This like isolated little bit of nature where they get to have this like really intimate moment uh, and everything's kind of laid out from the, the the opening shot of it and you see where they're standing and we only, we only get like one or two more cuts after that but like everything is all mostly kind of still and just this like arrangement of elements well but when you when you put it like that it makes me think that the the, the scene where uh, the whole class is uh, is uh, teasing uh, Shizuku about like her boyfriend I think that might have been like a, a Miyazaki cut. <laughs> Could yeah, it seems like it. There's so many people like piling over on top of yeah, each other. Yeah, it's so, so busy much dynamic and like, stuff happening. Yeah, it's it's the closest to like complete like ca- cartoonishness. Uh, yeah, like the Porco Rosso in. kind of uh, stuff going on. Right. Yeah. Uh, you 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 mentioned with the with the sound. Yeah, uh, it, it's something I, I try to pay more attention to. Uh, I'm very like a, a visual uh, and a dialogue uh, dude k- kind of guy. So, but this but- film had some weird things, right? Like in one scene, I still remember like some motorcycle re- was roaring up off screen, and for a moment, I was confused if outside someone had the motorcycle turn on or something because the sound design was so fucking on point. Yeah, yeah. So, so it has all these like bits of uh, realistic dialogue, but I, th- I think also the way it it uses music and and especially silence is kind of important. We we talked about how the um uh the the boutique f- felt like really magical i think part of that is there's this uh music that comes on when she finds the place uh like like uh, after it's it's a bit quiet when she gets to like the neighborhood and then when she enters there's this like little uh li- li- like a, f- a fiddle being played uh with like it just has this magical sound yeah which uh which also like gets repeated when she's uh shown into the uh the back door the workshop uh downstairs but then later like it's it becomes quiet like when she's settled in when she's like been looking at the the baron for a while um and then walks downstairs and the only sound is like this almost like really quiet almost asmr like a wood carving tool just like as uh, as uh, Sage is wor- working on the on the violin, um, and, and and so we get, we get from this like imaginative like world into this like tactile world and this like uh, intimate like little moment of like him sharing uh, his interest. Um, but, yeah, well, if we're talking about the sound and the music, should we talk about country roads being like, uh, I, I, the most I, I, major part of this? I think uh, I think we'll talk about it in a moment. Um, we, we we have a uh, it's it's almost the next thing on our agenda mm, okay oh yeah yeah um but yeah de- de- definitely like this the way the sound of uh, of uh traffic it becomes like a 
part of the setting is is really interesting and not something you really see in most other Ghibli films. Like it's it, it's uh, you mentioned it before, but it's a it's a departure from Miyazaki and Takahata's work that it takes place in the city and it's not like directly critical of uh, the, the city, the um, uh, development, technology, uh, and stuff like that. But but. I don't know. It, it, it's still kind of there. But do, do do you think it's like critical of uh, of the uh, <laughs> technology going on there? Because it's obviously it takes place in Tama Hills, the same place uh, in like in Pompoko where the uh, Tanuki village was trying so hard to main uh, to uh, keep to to preserve the natural environment. Here it, it's become a completely urban environment. Actually, fun fact about that is. And I couldn't verify this perfectly, but on the Nausicaa.net uh, page, there's oftentimes a lot of information. And it was said and quoted here that some of the old houses in Tama Hills that were like central uh, for Pompoko were actually uh, carefully placed by Miyazaki in some backgrounds. Like he wanted them to remain <laughs> somehow. Like the idea that, that something of the Pompoko thing is still left. But I couldn't find them. I've been looking for them. So take this information with a grain of salt. Like, yeah, there's, a, yeah. there's quite a few other little background elements, like the little yeah. bitch on her desk, who I assume is meant to be Kiki, yeah. and uh, says Porco Rosso on the clock. Hmm, I didn't notice that, actually. Did you not? Yeah, if you look real close uh, on the clock, it's right there. That, there might also other, be other some other things in the boutique that, that we yeah, haven't noticed. It's a very but, but yeah, scene, um, so probably in, in Shizuku's school, there's a map. Uh, uh, on the way to, to Shizuku's school, there's a map. And on this map, they're like drawn in several old farmhouses, which are labeled Old Village. I think this might be like the reference to the Pompoko thing that, that I'm thinking about. Like, uh, yeah, but but it is there. So this about like the idea of the city. So I mentioned it earlier in like my reading of like these surreal e-blood landscapes, right? That, that, that are painted by Inoue. Uh, I think this is like kind of the general attitude this film takes to the city. For better or for worse, you know, these young people are growing up in a city. They are living in the city. It's their environment. And for all the loss of nature that is bemoaned in both like uh, Miyazaki's and Takahata's work, this film shows us a kind of nature in the city, right? Like the urban like spaces that we can explore that have like organically grown, that are like the space of dreams and like magic as well as anything else. And as yeah, much as yeah. Pompoko shows how like fucking urbanized and anti-nature Tama Hill's recolonization was, this film really shows us, you know, people live here, people experience like little adventures here. Like the cat is perfectly adapted to the space. Like yeah, you can exactly. see how the cat say, traverses yeah. everything. And like the cat even has like other families the cat hangs out with, like the, this other like family called, yeah, called, that was, called that was really nice. Muto, Cause right? Because that yeah. almost feels like a magical element where like the cat is this roaming spirit, this rolling stone yeah. who like will just go, go anywhere and lead people. Oh, absolutely. And he, he can even use the train to get around. Like he understands the concept of like getting off at certain <laughs> yeah, stops. Yeah, pretty fun. And this transformation, I think, is wonderfully embodied in like the the, the translation of Country Roads, right? Like Country mm. Roads is like John Denver singing about like whatever West Virginia and nature and the river and the mountains. And Shizuko's like, okay, but that's not where I live. I live somewhere with concrete roads, you know? And then she thinks about concrete roads because that's her nature. That's her hometown. That's her transformed environment. And it's not a negative uh, song, right? It's not about yeah. how bad it is that it's concrete roads. She thinks it's kind of goofy because, you know, like, like at first, like they, like, like they talk about it too. To Seiji too, he thinks it's kind of cringe, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, he doesn't actually. He, he, he doesn't does, actually. He, 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 he says that's pretty to... cool, but he actually does kind of believe it. Because yeah, I think that's definitely yeah. true. It's not and like a think, critical yeah, lens. Uh, of maybe, the maybe we should, maybe we should like uh, back up a bit. So, country roads is, uh, yeah. is if if you somehow have lived under a rock for the past like fifty years or something. Um, is a so, uh, like a country song, a classic song by uh, uh, John Denver, um, that's shown up in a lot of like pop culture media uh, recently. Uh, but like, Whisper of the Heart did it before it was cool. Like the uh, the film opens oh, yeah. with with a cover uh, uh, of it, uh, a cover made in the seventies, I believe, um, and uh, a, a, a kind of plot point in in the film uh, established early on is. Uh, Shizuku is um, 
tr- uh, trying to translate the lyrics into Japanese uh, for like a, a school performance uh, type of thing. Yeah. Um, and in, in the process, she she has a bit of like a problem, like writing it in a way that doesn't feel tacky. Uh, and she makes like a sort of parody of it called Concrete Roads, which is like making fun of how, oh, this place is so wonderful and is like, kind of sarcastic because like, oh, it, everything is like concrete and city and yeah. noisy cars. But this um, is so interesting, yeah. right? Like the, at first it is like kind of ironic, but I think it's also genuine, right? The idea, why, like, why would we think like Concrete Road is ironic? Well, yeah, because we assume nature is like this mystical, magical place. But the movie itself shows us, you know, Concrete Road can lead you to adventurous places too, like to wonderful places too. The transformation uh, doesn't like invalidate like how much it is your hometown, how much you can experience there and the attachment, even though it feels kind of like ironic and it, oh, no, like, i i, I yeah. disagree I, I still think it's a a joke we even have uh saichi uh singing it to himself because he kind of likes the idea of it as well so i think yeah there's a that's little why I think note it's of not irony a joke, right? to it maybe from the perspective of probably miyazaki who like wrote this but in, in a way the film clearly shows that like the environment of the concrete roads in the cities yeah is magical and uh i think it really fits in well because because i feel like the critical part is that uh, Country Roads is like a is kind of like trying to be like an old kind of folk song, but it was written in the seventies. You know, like a, a point of very like rapid urbanization and development of America. But it's trying to like capture this ideal like Americana of like past centuries even, and this kind of like hometown feel of West Virginia, and like you really get that even from like the instrumentation. Like there's something ethereal about the song that I think why it's so popular. Because you really get this oh, feel de- of this like soul, definitely. this like hometown, and like in an attempt to translate it not just into Japanese but into how the characters feel about their circumstance and their home, is like kind of what the movie is also playing on. Because then we of course get the scene where they all uh, like have a jamboree and sing the the full translated version of her song. Yeah. Um, so okay. So my reading uh, is. Um uh let, 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 let's start with the song itself uh country roads so john denver is not from west virginia it's not his hometown he's from colorado i believe damn uh, what a and, hack and like and, and the, the, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, 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 the like the, the story goes that like um uh like uh, d- driving around uh like a- around the state boundary uh he- like uh, he would remember sometimes uh like catching west virginia radio and so in a way it co- sort of remind reminded him of uh, the road home but like uh, the more accurate story is probably the fact that they needed a state with uh the the right syllable stress massachusetts was a, a candidate <laughs> oh um, god <laughs> yeah um so, but but West Virginia was what they settled on, um, but still, it's been wholly embraced by uh, by the state and by like obviously people all over the country, and and it is really in that melody. Even if he hasn't like lived in West Virginia ever, you really believe that yearning, that nostalgia, and I think it's that nostalgia that's universal, no matter who sings it or where they sing about. It's been uh, covered by countless artists, and it's been translated into uh, i think i read like 19 different languages uh and before you ask there is a danish version it's not very good mm-hmm. um <laughs> no wonder is there a german version almost definitely that's, that's definitely a german version german um well, yeah, oh yeah there i is. think like, like so i said terrible. the, the oh, translated God. lyrics yeah. of country roads in japanese that like we get as the finalized version aren't really yeah. like in reference to anything that this doesn't talk about tokyo or west virginia it talks about someone just going on a journey and they exactly. dream of country roads that will take them home but they never really can return home so it's yeah, this exactly. like this it's, lament it's the, and this feeling. nostalgia that yeah like it kind of transcends and like just lives in the music yeah so this this universality um, might also be like part of the reason why it's turned up in a lot of like pop culture because like it's it's such an iconic song but like uh just for those wondering how come it t- uh, like his his songs turn up in like uh a dozen movies since 2017 plus the trailer for Fallout uh, uh 76 um in in 2014 uh John Denver's uh, catalog was transferred to a different record company 
uh, who made an uh, who started an effort into like making uh, his IP more valuable. So that's definitely part of the reason why it's been turning up so in so much lately. Um, but uh, that, that, that's a digression. Uh, back to Whisper of the Heart, which yes. did it before it was cool. Um, so they um, the the interesting thing about like the translation. So she starts out trying to like be more literal about it, like be, being okay, uh, talking about like oh the hometown that we love and stuff like that. But the issue there is like she doesn't have that nostalgia. Uh, it's not in her. Like she's a city girl. Uh, I think like it's her parents are probably like city people as well, um, and it, it it just feels tacky to her. So what like the proper translation, the one that she uh, she sings uh, along with Seiji and and like the, the whole uh, uh, ba- <laughs> music friends uh, coming along, um, that it it takes this universal nostalgia and translates it into this yearning for being in a different place, a country road taking you somewhere, uh, so- somewhere where adventure is, instead of taking you back home where the heart is. Um, but it's still the same feeling, but like yearning for some other place is like exactly what nostalgia is just like with distance instead of time. Yeah. Um, and, I th- and I think that is a really, really great bit of characterization um, be- because it ties into like how she has to find something that's in within her, like her own experience before she can actually like express yeah. it in a genuine way. Yearning for um, and, her future, and it gets back to, to this theme of tradition versus modernity that like that there's still that universal nostalgia but like it's a different context yeah it's finding her future right like the, the entire yearning is and the entire theme of the film is like opening her pathway into the, into her own future that she herself wants to find and craft for herself and that's also like the reason i think the concrete votes is like it it, it is a joke it, it, it is like uh i mean a, a, a joke I, about how it doesn't fit with where we live it's it's just like not a song for 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 this experience we've had so i think the transformation of the song is important and i don't think we can just write it off as a joke because seiji at one point in the film says he likes the song like he liked concrete roads like he, yeah. he this isn't just him like getting brownie points in my opinion like like he first mocks it but then he says but i liked it well I, here's the reason I, I, I because i kind of read that as him like getting the joke like like uh, he like I mean, the, the whole like tease uh, teasing part is like she didn't mean for that to be the serious translation. So him like saying, I wouldn't go with that though. It's kind of like, well, like it's the same with the lunchbox that he like makes a joke about, oh, you eat a huge lunch. And it's like, no, it's for my dad. Like it's again, that pretend misunderstanding. Um, I, I think it's what ha- what's happening. That's my reading anyway. So I think what happens, uh, and, and this is kind of important to me, is that uh, the concrete road is an important formative step. She, her getting lost and being aimless was important for her finding her future. Concrete roads is important for her finding the proper country roads translation. And this step, the concrete roads, if we like take her urban sprawl adventure, following the cat is like an embodiment of the concrete road sentiment of like being aimless and wandering around the city and like uh, uh, this kind of uh, entire, you know, whimsical drive then it is an important formative step of finding the more serious like steps into adulthood in the future or into later adolescence. Yeah, I think I think I agree with Nyad here. I, I think there's 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 too much of a genuineness to the way it presents concrete roads because because again he does mock it and say I wouldn't go with that one. But then he also says the the lunch thing because he's he's as the film is presenting him at this point, he's like really snarky. Even his character design, he's kind of like sharper featured and his eyes are kind of narrow. He like looks like this kind of like annoying kid character who's going to be reoccurring. But then when he opens up to her and we peel back the layers and uh, he's genuine with her. And then we even get that uh, bit. Uh, where much he, softer design. Yeah, we he's get soft a much soft, softer design to him. And then he's like singing country roads, I mean concrete roads to himself. Because that's yeah, well. the version he prefers and he actually identifies with because he's still a city kid like her. Yeah, but I, I, I think like it's obviously like it's meant to be... Uh, I still think it's meant to be a joke, but like a, a joke that comes from a very real place. And, yeah, uh, and like so. as, as part of like... It, it's it's a kind of like a way like she creatively like sort of brainstorms it. Like, like you, you can definitely like imagine that situation where she's like trying to translate it literally, doesn't really understand the like the exact emotions and, and it's just like 
getting frustrated with it and then comes up with this joke because I've never been to uh, the country. So like, let's uh, ha ha this is like, like, but it elicits a laughter, laughter from, from, from people like, like people well, find it like I think it, it like, actually, funny. in that sense, it shows a good example of, yeah, like now you were saying the artistic process and because she's, uh, she's thinking of what's the literal way to translate it, but she thinks that's not too good. And yeah, then she but, tries to radically redesign it with concrete roads to, you know, readapt the ideas. But then that doesn't really work either. And then in the final version, she reaches like the soul of what the song is getting at. Like yeah. the, uh, the much deeper feeling to it that you can't really just have by directly translating the lyrics. Yeah, that's why I say like con- concrete road is like in universe meant to be uh, l- like a joke, but it's a joke coming from a real place. Yeah. Uh, mm. so, so I can yeah. definitely see why you would like, See, see it as like this uh, genuine feeling for for the city um but but i i don't know i i don't know if the city is such a, 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 a like fo- fo- focal point like like that there's no real arc about like learning to appreciate the city over the countryside i i would actually say like it's the other way around if anything uh, I, I don't feel like she needs to learn to appreciate the city because she's grown up in it and she's living in it she's exploring it like she also never really encounters the countryside, right? Like we have all the, uh, I think a lot of emotions and a lot of prospects for the future are coded with visuals related to the city. Like the the entire idea that, that Seiji's basement looks out over the city and this is where she waits as she's trembling, wanting to hear the feedback and that they unite up on a hill looking over the city covered in fog and dew oh, yeah, and yeah, as yeah, the definitely. sun rises. Everything is coded in the city. So the city is the environment that contains their future and present and well, their I hopes think- and aspirations. I, th- I think actually we're sort of conflating uh, conflating things here because um, like with Miyazaki and Takahata, there's this clear separation between countryside and city, uh, and because they're more they're more uh, traditionalist communal uh, communally minded uh, artists, they uh, th- it ends up becoming like uh, the, the bad technology versus the like more pure stuff. But I, th- I think like the separation between tradition and modernity is definitely present in this, even if it isn't I- explicitly represented as city versus country, if that makes sense. Uh, I, I, I think it's like an interesting part of the movie is how technology is such a, it, it's a part of the setting uh, in the same oh, way that the country yeah. is and stuff like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, like the very really first thing, about. the very first thing, right? Like where, where the dad and Shizuku talk about the idea that the, uh, like the library, library card, the library card system is switching to barcodes, and she's bemoaning this fact because in this this barcodes uh, in this previous system, she found some magic. She found this name that she kept seeing, Seiji's name that was already in the books that she had lent, uh, uh, borrowed. Like the idea that um, that you can find like some magic in these olden ways, and there's also this like plot happening almost in the background where like the sister complains or the mother. Either one of them complains and saying, "Well, I should really buy a computer for like a digital word processor." Yeah, at and some point like, they and, have and, one, yeah. like a real old laptop. <laughs> it's yeah. just that at some point, yeah. But uh, Shizuku ends up writing the book fully just on paper. She like has to write it all down. She doesn't go for like a, a laptop or anything like that. Yeah, but like it, it's it's part of like the modernity uh, of it. Like back in 1995, that was like uh, holy how shit. Modernity was like becoming a part of the Japanese world. Um, I just realized how fucking antiquated the way uh, Seiji is making the violence is. Like this very like physical, like medieval yeah. craft with like the immediate tools, like carefully chiseling and carving, uh, which is super interesting con- uh, thinking about like the purpose of technology because both Shizuku and Seiji are both resistant to like using modern technology to make their work easier. And their work is entirely characterized by themselves like honing the craft, like really laboring and toiling away to hone the yeah. craft without shortcuts in any it's capacity. Ve- it's very traditional Japanese, uh, like craftsmanship uh, worship in a way. Yeah, um, that but, fits uh, very well. Yeah, I yeah, think that's it, a good point. Yeah, and, and it's not just like the barcodes and uh, com- computers. Um, there's, there's also, um, I, I think maybe this is the time uh, that when it's appropriate to mention what obviously to everyone is the real true legacy of this film the chill beats to relax slash study to uh oh, yeah. is the from infamous. like the, the clip <laughs> is from this uh movie yeah. when she's studying yeah. 
I, the picture I, of the girl just, with the headphones, like studying. Yeah, yeah that's that's this it, moment. It's the a moment pretty cool lo-fi hip hop was created. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is like the uh, the origin. Um, which, like, I just want to acknowledge that uh, I don't know if there's much to read into. Ex- like, uh, but like, I, I kind of think that um, the, the the clip specifically where she's actually like studying while listening uh to music with the earphones it has it has this like quality of being retro but but while also being something modern and i think that's why it, it fits so well with that sort of aesthetic um because like obviously like studying with headphones on is like a completely like new thing a, 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 like a relatively new thing at least like like it's um we, we all know like japanese technological boom through the 80s and stuff um but 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 it still has this like t- traditional feel like it, it's it's a relatively old movie at least to the generation uh, like us growing up with uh <laughs> chill boots to relax slash study to um so I, I don't know that that's like the only thing i can really like think of is that combination of a vintage modern uh feel of it which is like the feel of much of the technology in the uh, in the movie, um, but yeah, g- getting back to what Nyad was talking about with yeah, uh, the, 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 that's where I find the uh, conflict is. It's not between countryside and city. Uh, well, except in the translation uh, part, but it, it's more of like tradition and modernity, and like it, it is like a really like modern family she has. It's it's not at all the uh, the oh, yeah. tradcore Miyazaki uh, dream uh, of the house mom uh, and, and stuff like it. The, the the father is like working at a library. The mother is um, taking her finals uh, in uh, medicine, I believe. Like she's trying to become a doctor. Yeah, um, he, like she's the, getting this, her master's degree in something. Yeah, and the the the, the sister is uh, like uh, about to move out, uh, and and it's like oh, good for you, and uh, we will have like some money things. And also, like the place they live is it, it's it's a, a relatively cramped apartment, um, which I, I think is like it a really interesting little bit of world building. Is um, she goes to her friend's uh, what was her name uh, Harada? Um, I don't yeah. remember her first name. Um, to uh, to to her house, and it, she's obviously it's obvious that she lives in oh. a more affluent neighborhood. She has a whole room to herself. Yeah, she's with fucking a whole bed. rich. Yeah, the entire then, room is filled with like plushies and like comfy shit, and like yeah. they have this little wonderful like tea set going on there. Yeah, her father watching television downstairs. They have stairs. They live in a house. Um, I, th- I thought that was a really also like a, a really small little bit, and this is a complete uh, tangent. But wh- where she says she's not, uh, she and her dad isn't talking right now. Like, I. The hmm. only thing that adds is just like this feeling that 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 would probably be a thing that that could be happening. Yeah, with that's a, actually with a really that nice element that I feel ties into a, yeah. a lot of the themes of maturity in the film. It's once again like completely un, like actually completely like story wise completely unnecessary, but like just a little flourish to add like this uh, lived in feel to uh, to like the world and the characters. Um, but uh, but yeah, like the the house the the the, the apartment that uh, Shizuku lives in. Uh, is like really this uh, city house, like uh, f- filled with books, obviously, but like also, yeah, e- uh, earphones, uh, like uh, and phones, phones, <laughs> and, um, and 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 the, the laptop thing, and uh, and the talk about barco- barcodes, and this is like in contrast to uh, Seiji and his and, and his grandfather. Uh, who, who have this like much more traditional? He's an old craftsman. He takes these old things and restores them. So so there's that tradition element, and and this, this is also where like one of the most joyous moments in the film is uh, when they sing "Country Roads" uh, and the grandfather and his music friends just come along and start playing. Oh yeah, she she gets this experience of a creative family, like of musicians and artists uh like how they have fun which is like in contrast to her family which have like this sort of dry dynamic although obviously like they still love each other and uh care for each other and they uh, support oh, yeah. her in her endeavor as we find yeah, out which is really important yeah talking about the dryness just like a like, very little side fact um Maybe you've noticed, but the the voice actor of her father yeah, isn't actually yeah. like an actual voice actor. It's like like a journalist 
it, they got like a, a, a pretty well-known <laughs> journalist to like voice this character. <laughs> I don't know exactly why, but I mean, it, it makes this serious, like stern, very real kind of impression of him. Yeah, like and, he feels so yeah. real, like the way he talks and like his politeness and and, and when he's stern, he's still talking with a soft voice. I, but I also really real like Japanese voice. dad, right? Everything like calm, smoking, sitting at the dinner table and like calmly assessing the situation, not really emoting much. That's that's calm Japanese dad right there well, for you. I like that. It almost works as a good um, good comparison to the dad in uh, Only Yesterday where he would just yeah, I was about and, like, to say. not pay attention. Yeah. But there's a good bit where they're seriously discussing her future. And the dad goes to smoke, but then the wife's like, "What are you doing?" It's like, oh, "All right," and then he puts it down. <laughs> yeah, but but, but no, um, what it actually reminds me more of is like the um, uh, the the present day quote unquote parts of Only Yesterday, because like it has this just naturalistic feel that is in contrast to much in the movie. It's like it just his voice and his mannerisms are just so. Man, I I, I could imagine that guy like in front of me, and not not just a, an anime character. Yeah, but yeah, that, 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 that's that, that's a good point. Yeah, love that. He looks voice. kind of like young Miyazaki. Yeah, have you ever seen pictures of young Miyazaki? He didn't have the beard, but he had exactly those glasses. He looked exactly <laughs> like that guy. It's crazy. Hmm. hmm. Maybe it's not a coincidence that uh, Kondo's uh, character design of the father figure uh, looks like Miyazaki. But that's maybe reading too <laughs> much into shit. it. Holy shit! Yeah, that's some psychoanalysis shit right here. That's some auteur th- uh, auteur theory. So, uh, again, considering the whole like difference between this, uh, like this work, like we say with the modern city setting, uh, I think it's very clear of like the age gap between Kondo and uh, Miyazaki and Tada- Takahata. Or, like they're these two kind of uh, older guys that remember things the way they used to be a bit more. Oh yeah, they, holy they shit! Think about it way more. But Kondo's kind of like, nah, this this kind of is how things are now. So I might as well like make things heartfelt from this way as opposed to like looking backwards but yeah. honestly this is also a part that Miyazaki really wanted to do uh, in his design document uh, uh, not design document in his pitch that in starting point there's the uh, whisper, whisper of the heart pitch and and it's like titled why shoujo manga now and he explains why he wants like to do like this very simple straightforward shoujo manga and what he basically says is that he thinks like the modern world is very chaotic and complicated but he wants to return to the essence of what being alive means and mm-hmm. that kids need like a long term perspective and that and he kind of literally says like uh, it is us middle-aged men trying to point out that the naivety and the fragility of such dreams that children have uh, 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 are valid and we cannot deny this longing and uh, this like purity of this moment, like these these fantastical moments of like encountering someone of the opposite sex and falling in love, and the yearning for the future, uh, and and so on. So he said th- the challenge is that we middle aged old men want to challenge like the young people to you know live fully and authentically, basically with this work. Yeah, uh, maybe this is the time to talk about the like romantic uh, side of, uh, of the story. There's a whole love triangle uh, going on, and it's played completely straight. Yeah. Well, I, I think the whole thing with the love triangle really is inseparable from the film's um, attitudes towards like maturity and immaturity and the journey of Shizuku through it. Where the whole love triangle thing, you're right, it starts out playing it completely straight between... Uh, her, her friend and the the boy her friend has a crush on who then you know of course turns out to have a crush on her but it's like played in a way that's obviously straight but it's still in a way like very childish because it's like no one really came clean about everything everyone's all like embarrassed uh blushing ghibli face about everything and only when she ends up talking to um uh seiji does she kind of find like a like a more mature adult kind of love that is oh, like yeah. about respecting the person and understanding them? Because I think it's this, very clear. That's part of the reason why I think that this this movie has just such a feminine energy to it that like most of Ghibli's works just like don't in the same way, and it's very much in those like shoujo romantic parts. Like it, they feel so again like like the way it's so grounded and lived in. Like I I I was like. Um, L- looking up the director while watching this for the first time, I was like, wait, it's not a woman? Like, I, I was genuinely <laughs> like, uh, wow, just yep, how, but, how but much it, it like, underst- like uh, understands the, also like the difference between like how boys and girls approach it. Um, just, it's, it's just so, so cute in that way. 
Yeah, it is based on a shoyo manga after all. And and Miyazaki kind of points something out like this too, like the difference between boys and girls in this film. Um, I'm quoting like from starting point right now. Uh, at a time when most children are avoiding the future, our young boy is living purposefully. So what happens when our shoujo heroine meets such a boy? This is like, for him, the inciting moment of this movie. Like, this boy is living purposefully and now you meet up. And the spark of romance and like fantasy and this urban exploration and the useful like adolescent open future coalesces into this one moment, the, this one formative moment, this encounter. So it is a romantic change in her life as well as like and this is probably a very important point to make right like it is her not changing so that he would like her it is her changing so she can like catch up with him and that's such an important like distinction for me to make right like that's the difference between her just wanting to uh, be good for a man and her finding deep inspiration in this relationship, in this love and wanting to be a good person because of it. Um, I, th I think also a, um, an interesting part of it is, uh, is how th this movie deals with like the, uh, like adolescence as a theme and like transitioning, um, like w way, way from the beginning of the film, uh, her friend is talking about, wouldn't it be nice to have a boyfriend, you know, because it would make like the whole, uh, exam part and, uh, going to high school easier. Like it's, it's the inciting, uh, yeah. like it's the inciting thing is like something is, ch things are changing. Something has got to give, something has to change. Um, and, and like, uh, as mentioned before, like the start of the movie is very concerned with this everyday existence. Um, th this like routine that, uh, th that the main character is in. Um, which like she she's tra transitioning away from it like in, into like uh, from a reader to a, a writer from a middle schooler to a high schooler from someone not really interested in boys to like uh, someone with a boyfriend and there's the whole romantic uh, plotline is is all like her relationships with her friends are changing uh, and yeah. and yeah yeah like it, I think it's a central part of the of the film. Also how she plays matchmaker for a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's keyed most in with how it, it presents the love triangle because we see, again, it's like they're presented uh, straight, but there's still these clearly very childish emotions and aspirations where like her friend is like, oh, I like him, but I don't, I don't want to say anything. And I'm like, she just gets nervous being around him and like runs away. And then he's like, well, I like you. Uh, like in that scene where he talks to her in the, the little grove by the shrine. But again, it's all this like very childish and like shallow feeling emotion where it's just like, well, I know you're kind of pretty or whatever. And then when uh turns out she's having feelings for Seiji, she goes up on the roof with Seiji and everyone in the class just like goes absolutely like bananas. They're all like, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, a bunch of idiots because they're kind of like left behind, still immature, still like just seeing it as like a funny like game or whatever, or just something to be joked around about. But like Seiji and uh, I don't know, um, Shizuku. Shizuku and Seiji, they're like already in adulthood because they're already seeing each other as like two people that like they can understand and they will like have dreams and like go on to do stuff. So they've, they've already like been elevated above the class. Like we see them standing alone having like a very romantic shot where it's just the two of them like looking out at the horizon that would be from like a romance movie. But then you look back at the class and they're like animated, like like a, almost like the uh, the tanuki. They're just like jumbling around and falling over each other, scrambling yeah. about like idiots. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Like this it's real it's... contrast between like adulthood, not just being like you know growing up, but like finding something that is your dream and finding a passion and understanding the sacrifices you have to make for it, and understanding like the craft and hours and the stress that comes with it. But like ultimately being a better person for it and finding that to share with someone. Yeah, like, it's it's not just like, uh, oh, I like you, go out me, with me. No, no, it's like, I've, uh, I I find you a fascinating, inspiring person and I want to understand you and you you inspire me. Like, and, and yeah, uh, I, I want to, like, yeah. be with you uh, in a way. I, 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 I think that's a, like, great way of putting it. I mean, I and of course, then we get the ending where he proposes yeah. to her. <laughs> And Marriage, he's like, because exactly. that's like the ultimate mature thing where he's like, I don't, I don't care about this. I know where I'm going in my life. 
you will marry me when we're older <laughs> enough. Like, you know, like that's the direction that this is headed. I think yes. that's actually like a bit ch- tongue in cheek. That's, that's how I read that. Maybe like, a little so bit. It's, it's kind of like the um, next stage of like, okay, you're not that mature. <laughs> this is so, like this play at it. Kind actually, of. here's a very like, important the feelings thing. Are genuine. So it is indeed the case that that like we all like feel the marriage is it comes a bit quick and Miyazaki also had like to justify his decision to rewrite the ending of the manga which is, it's a is one of the differences by the way so it's Tradco very purposeful Miyazaki <laughs> this, this by again. the way let's, let's get into a couple of the rewrites just to point out how significant they are to exactly the stuff we've been talking about so of course, the rewrite I just mentioned in the end of the manga, Seiji uh, uh, says, I love you at the end rather than asking for the marriage. Miyazaki himself comments on this and said, I wanted them to commit to something by the end. So, mm. so the entire theme of the film goes into committing to something, right? Yeah. Uh, Seiji needs to commit to doing this hard, like, like travel to Italy, like moving there to go to this specialized school. Shizuko needs to commit two months to writing this, this novel. Um, um, the committing to marriage is just the same kind of layer. He wants, like, his main drive for writing this film like he did and rewriting the story like he did was, as he said, like, in the very early design document, to, like, give a long-term perspective to today's, like, the young people. And, yeah, it's kind of tread, right? Like, like promise the 14-year-old girl you marry her. Like, that's that's a bit rough, you know? <laughs> but, yeah, it, it is rough. and clearly It is in line with bit. the themes here. It clearly shows that he's like you know still a bit immature in like a, a practical sense, but again, yeah, it's it's in line with the looking forward and like looking towards maturity, and like he he knows where he's going with his life and yeah. she knows where she's going, so it's yeah. almost like well we might as well decide this now you know like there's no stopping us. Yeah, this is also an important part of her like uh, character uh, t- transition. L- l- like um, the the main development in in the movie is internal, and we will definitely like get into it uh pretty soon. But uh, I I think it's really important how like the getting more mature starts out as like a a, a bit of conflict in her life. Like she she wasn't really ready for having that conversation with a childhood friend. Uh, of like I don't like you that way uh, kind of and she feels like shit like that's what that wasn't mm. how it's supposed to happen I'm I'm terrible uh, and like she it's like she tells the cat um, but um, and, and and at that point she has this really interesting line where, where she says I, I don't even like really find fairy tales that fun books that fun anymore because a part of me is constantly telling myself that things aren't that easy which leads perfectly into the next rewrite that I wanted to bring up. Because one of the other rewrites is that Shizuku doesn't get into trouble at school due to these time spent writing a story. So the entire exam subplot is not in the manga. That is also added. The complications, the hardships of committing to this, the reason it is not not that easy, that's entirely rewritten. And the other rewrite... Uh, in the original, Seiji is a painter, not a violin maker. There's no subplot of him leaving to go to Italy and so on and so on. And Miyazaki explicitly said the reason he put this in there is he wanted young people who become artisans and artists who have to work really hard to achieve it. This is why he changed it. And really perfectly in line with it is not so easy as in fairy tales. Like this is a, this is an honest look kind of like... The prom- promise of marriage is highly romanticized, obviously, but like the treatment of how the art and craft in this film and the hardships faced on the way are, are done is honest. Yeah, it is a and that, ton and of work. And I, th- I think that's also like um, that, that. That's also a way in which like her transition into maturity, like it starts out being this ah shit, things aren't that easy, and like the stories don't feel as fun anymore. Into like acknowledging that things aren't easy and and like oh. fi- still finding the inspiration to uh, to to make something and enjoy things what i think is kind of crazy too is like the start of the movie has this project of hers like read 20 books before like summer's over like this is so weird it's like like respect. going out respect go- for that though <laughs> yeah good respect for that but also it's like going out like i want to watch like i don't know like like complete like animes on, on my anime list like <laughs> get your list number higher uh, and i i felt like it was kind of clear that she did it a lot to find this name in the books, right? 
to find Seiji's name in the book. She has kind of already like romanticized this. I don't think she had all that much. Like, how much joy do you have in reading when you have to make up, make yourself like commit to a number of how many books to read? <laughs> I think she was already kind of like existentially bored. Yeah, yeah, but but uh, as I mentioned earlier, it, it it's part of the whole like establishing a routine uh, existence yeah. at the start, which is in transition. Like it, it, it's it, it's everywhere in the film. That there's obviously. Seiji is also in a period of transition, like uh, becoming uh, an artisan uh, artist in, in, instead of like a traditional high schooler, and uh, and we also see it in the in the family where, as mentioned earlier, the the mum is about to graduate and start her job, and the sister is about to move out. Like everything is like changing around her, and like she has to like t- get the resolve to change something uh, in herself as yeah. well. Yeah, and also uh, as just as a as a little thing. How fitting that the uh, the changed lyrics of Country Roads now have a bit where it goes, uh, like can't want to go back, can't go back, and like that repeating like motif in all the lyrics of the translation about going down these country roads, but they're only ever taking you somewhere new, and you can only ever like think of the place you used to be. You can't ever actually go there again because like you're always changing, you're always going forwards. Yeah. You can never step into the same river twice. Yeah. No, yeah yeah and uh like like and and the whole way like again the nostalgic longing becomes like a, a longing oh, for something new and better uh which uh like like she didn't necessarily have at the start she she escaped into into books uh, in in order to get that feeling of like being somewhere else but like she can only do that for so long um, I, I think that's actually like the, the the next big theme in in the the film is like escapism, uh, imagination, which also like ties into like the whole uh, yeah cr- creative work uh, but, aspect. But just of it. quickly, as hipster made me realize, like the whole idea of like the road goes forward, like time goes on, uh, that made me think about the old man character, someone like Nishi. I think he's called Nishi. Um, oh yeah, yeah. How he looks with nostalgia and yearning onto his past where he was like separated from his lover and there's this whole tragic story involving this and like he's sadly looking into the flames as the like log in front of him crumbles apart right this this is kind of sad now that you explained to me hipster that in the lyrics of the song we have this movement of time that almost cruelly takes you away from that previous place in the past and into the future but he like the old man he's like the nicest old man ever he's completely like accepted this uh that time has passed and and shizuku's at the very start of this road of this journey into her life while he's at uh, at a very late stage of it and that's something i'm just now ruminating on because i didn't uh get much like uh in terms of like thematic analysis out of the old man before but now that really puts it into context yeah i think he frames things in a way that's like um you can you go down the path that you, you go down and you you make your choices and it might not even end up well because again the movie kind of has this vague illusion about like the struggle and like uh if shizuku will be any good as a writer or if she'll do anything and like the old man in a way you can kind of frame it as like yeah he went out into the world and did stuff and he only came back with like a lot of heartbreak and that's his life really and like you know maybe maybe it wasn't worth it maybe it was but it's like that's that's the uh, the route you got to go down. Yeah, that's also like the the, the line that uh, Seiji says, and uh, Shizuku repeats later. Like, that, there's tons of people as good as me. Um, yeah, yeah, like even... and and, and again gets back to the commitment thing uh, Nyan was talking about. But I also think like the the grandfather's uh, story, his, his life story, is also a part of that whole things aren't that easy uh, concept because yeah, like it it's just such a perfect romance he's setting up there. But like he like like, like uh, the the story about how he found like the reason like the uh, the the Baron the the uh, cat doll is so important to him is because like he 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 fell in in love with that and wanted to buy it he couldn't because it had like a partner doll a, a lady doll uh, but but then like this lady he was seeing <clears throat> um is his lady friend uh said okay I'll keep the lady doll and we'll reunite them one day. And it's like, oh yeah, but then the war happened, and they never met e- each other again. Mm. Things aren't that easy. Well, yeah, because um, yeah, because it could be so easy in like a more um, simple movie, 
Yeah. Uh, Shizuku could be like a world star like yeah. writer and be great. Yeah, just it. amazing. Yeah. He could be a prodigy of violin making. But he even says there's dozens of people much better at it than me. And like and they'll want just to have get, to but, see yeah. how this turns out. They'll just have to decide to work hard at it. Yeah. By um, the way, we've traced how every uh, life isn't so easy moment has been a rewrite. This Baron thing as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so also a rewrite. In the manga, the Baron exists, but his fiance wasn't finished rather than uh, out for repairs or whatever. And uh, um, Seiji, Seiji's grandfather didn't have a romance in that, uh, uh, in that story at all. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, oh, yeah. It's all coming together. It's all coming together. This is uh, this is why I like looking at adaptation and changes because it reveals so clearly often what the film wants you to think about as like yeah. as an important aspect of the story. Hmm. Yeah. Um, get, get, getting back to what I, I was uh, beginning to talk about with escapism as as, as a th thing throughout, which which she has to like she has to escape escapism, <laughs> so so to speak. Um, like at, at the start of the uh, film, she like. She's escaping into these books, these fantasy worlds, um, and what be something that becomes a part of this fantasy world is uh, Seiji, like the, this mysterious stranger who has read oh, these yeah. books. I wonder what kind of mysterious and quiet and kind guy that is. I want to meet him. Like she's falling in love with this idea. She's escaping into the books and into her own imagination in that yeah, way. Yeah, she's built up this whole character and she's really disappointed when it yeah. turns out that he's just this guy. <laughs> yeah, it's such a fun fun little moment there. Um but uh as I mentioned earlier, like when she uh has this moment where like things start maturing, things aren't that easy, she tries to escape into the boutique, but it's closed. Uh like she 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 wants to go there when she feels down and feels like the fantasy of the books don't resonate with her anymore. Um, and, and like, uh, like, and like, finally she has to, um, she, she decides to, uh, like, uh, not, not just escape, but, but like go to a different world and like write that, uh, novel, like, uh, and, and like make it some, something that's part of the actual world, like making something creatively, not just like con uh, consuming and escaping. I also like notice notice also how Keiji is key to each of these stages. No, no, Seiji, sorry, uh, Seiji is key to each of these uh, stages. Like at, at the start, he's part of that, uh, like immature fantasy, like like part part of that world she dives into that that isn't real. Later, he becomes uh, key to like showing her into the boutique but like from a different angle like understanding it not just as a as a place of escape but as a place of like craftsmanship work and and like art um and and later obviously he becomes her motivation to uh, to write the story yeah because because she's impressed by his determination to go and go to italy and yeah. I think their relationship, and I need to mention this uh, uh, because I think I only talked about it before we recorded or on a break or whatever, because their relationship comes to a head when both of them have like kind of found their future. She's finished writing the story and he's been to Italy and has like experienced like the first workshop and decided this will be my future. Um, am I mixing this up? Had he, no, no, he was on his yeah. way to commit to the first two month long workshop, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly, when she's yeah, yeah, like, yeah. she feels like he's leaving her behind and she exactly. wants to do something about it. And that's when she writes. And, but, and that, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that whole sequence is just, of, of, of her writing, is just so genuine. And it feels like like the core of the story is really about like yeah. imagination and creativity and where in where you find inspiration and, and where the struggle is and, and the, the yeah. point of it all. I think, I think that's like the best part of the movie. Where I meant to go is like the, she has this period of two months where she is furiously writing the novel. That is where Seiji is in Italy to yeah. to to do the exactly. thing, and he's back afterwards. Like the day after she finished her novel, like she falls into bed and her father like comments on it and says, "Oh, like like the soldier at peace or whatever." Like she's been working so hard, and he's kind of proud. You can see it too, and yeah. she's just 
completely overworked and now she's sleeping. And she, because of this, she wakes up very early. And when she wakes up very early, someone is outside her window and it's Seiji waiting for her. Like in this very like romantic, like coincident kind of moment. They run out, they together like like bike up the hill so they can look at the sunrise. And that is when the scene happens that I wanted to mention that perfectly embodies like what their relationship dynamic is. It is when Seiji has her on the back of his bicycle and is trying to pedal up the hill. And he's like, no, I swore to myself I would pedal you up this hill. She gets off the bike and says, uh, I'm no man's burden. As she pushes the bike's bicycle with him on it up the hill and like Hell helps yeah. push. Like she's not go just going to be his like, 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 the, the, like the person he takes care of. No, she has now through her own work self-actualized to such an extent that she does need to be someone's burden, but that she's on a level with him and she pushes the bike with him. And it, that's wonderful. It's Push also it, such girl. a cute scene because, like, he could have just got off the bike and walked out. Yeah. And, like, he's just, <laughs> yeah, it's so he's silly. just straining itself. And by the end, they're both, like, dying from exhaustion. <laughs> it's just, like, such a cute moment to end on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's great. G g getting back to, like, the writing for a moment, I really, really love how the grandfather, like, encourages her. And, like, the, the whole symbol with the gem is yeah. such a like such a like I I just I really appreciate it when movies are up front with their symbolism, like don't hide it. Come on, like like just say what you mean to say. <laughs> and this is like as direct as it gets. He's like, you want to see a metaphor, girl? Here you go. Um, yeah. But, but this, but anyway, this what, look, what he, there's some shiny nice yeah. thing inside. We can polish it with a lot of hard work, and then we might find some very beautiful stone inside. No, it's, it's, that's it's like not, you, it's girl. Not, it's not exactly that. It's it's more specific than that, which is what what I love about this metaphor. Oh. Like he he, it, it's this like a uh, rock that you you find emerald in, and 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 he shows how like you you can it it looks like a lump of coal except a little crack in it, and like uh, with, with a bit of light you can see the gleaming gem there, and what he tells her is like you're about to uh, embark on an artistic journey here. You're about to make something, uh, but it has to come from inside of you. And it not just has to come from inside of you, it had, has to come from the right part of you. Like, you you have to find the gem in there. Like, you have to avoid the worthless rock, that no matter how much you polish that rock, it won't be a gem. You have to find the gem. You might even find, like, even deeper inside. You might cut out some 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 of the pretty stuff and find an even prettier one. But, like, you have to, uh, you, you have to find that gem first. And that's what the first draft is. It's not polishing anything. It's about finding the gem and she and and that that moment when he reads it and she's so, just so filled with anxiety like what if what i found was the lump of coal what if there's nothing there oh, and he comes out visual. and it's like do you you did some great you you did wonderfully you uh the the, the, the story is fine and she's like no but but it's all it's all wrong it, the, la the last part of it didn't make sense and he's like listen to me you found the gem, like the polishing comes later. And like just the sheer relief in her is just so touching. Yeah. Uh, and, and just the, I, I want the old grandma artisan guy to tell me I did a good job. Yeah. He's it's such good. a good, oh. God, he's so loving. Uh, but also I love how this scene is coded visually because she gets out onto the balcony, like getting down on the ground, like uh, hugging her knees as she's like really full of anxiety in front of this huge horizon and balcony of the city that we know. And we know like how the horizon in the city is coded as like this entry, this window into the future that we have this entire time. She's like crumbling in anxiety because of her future in front of her future right there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, another thing like being direct with your metaphors does is like it allows you to like add like more 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 subtle parts like how the, it ties back together with um with the baron uh who has these gems for eyes which in the right light seem like really living and and f like filled with little in imperfection but, but still like uh, gleaming uh, eyes it's it, i think it's supposed to be the reason why she thinks it's alive uh, for a second uh, when she first meets it um and like oh yeah how gems become um the gemstones become like like this symbol for cre the creative urge in general and ha and inspiration like like she finds inspiration in the baron uh, and and like yeah. the world uh, that she imagines is like all about these um this this world filled with like houses with gems in them and these magical craftsmen um there's also like this uh r really like clever little transitioning shot 
from uh, the 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 couple uh, the, the main couple sitting there in the library reading. By the way, she again. This is like the uh, I mentioned it before. The transition between like uh, grounded reality and imagination, where she researches gems. Um, a, a, again, like this bridging between the real and how it inspires the fantastic. Um, yeah, we also get the scene yeah. that uh, is her writing the story, and in the story, the main character, who's like an analog for her, yeah. is like hurry, hurrying through this massive cave of gems, but they keep on like going out, and she yeah. has to find the one, the tiny little one that's the, the yeah, real inspiration and the real heart yeah. of the and story. And she finds a dead baby bird. Oh, yeah. Holy because shit. that's what she's worried about. She's worried about that yes. that's what she finds, n- like nothing. Uh, like, like the so, something useless and dead uh, on on arrival. That that's that, that's uh, that's every creator's nightmare in that situation. That, obviously, yeah, that scene reminded me so much of Angel's Egg because there's a lot about the dead baby bird in Angel's Egg, and Oshi is obviously well known, a friend of Studio Ghibli and the people working there. So I, I wonder if there's some parallel. Uh, um, <laughs> oh, uh, what I was going to mention was this tr- uh, clever little transition shot between um, her and uh, Seiji uh, sitting in the library reading, uh, and 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 it fades to a uh, a lamp post uh, like in front of a tree, and, and like it, for, for for the like couple of seconds where it, the, the 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 two shots are fading together, like oh, there's a green glow around them. It's that like pure creative inside it's inside them it's between them kind of thing like it, it it's not subtle but like subtlety is overrated honestly <laughs> to be perfectly honest yeah i mean there's a lot of things that aren't quite subtle but there are also some maybe not subtle things but i think like some symbolism we, should, we kind of should talk about a bit because i, I myself have a, like a little bit of a struggle to figure it out exactly right um i want to understand um together with you uh the oh before we get into the complicated ones i have an easy one still uh, you remember the wood carving of like the violin builder sitting in like this prison cell yeah but while she's this, researching she finds this yeah. image yeah yeah and, and that's like a wood carving of like obviously like the violin builder is is like similar to seiji and she sees like some very similar struggle in her artistic struggle and like seiji uh, uh as the violin builder and i find it interesting how she returns to this picture right in her room and she's like having this crisis and dreams of the dead bird like very shortly after she wakes up and she rolls around on her floor and opens up the book and there's the violin builder again and it's like the idea of the artist toiling away looking at the sun outside of the prison right the idea that you're stuck kind of oh this will such this this has such a tragic parallel that will get right at the very end yeah. of the cast i believe too but the idea of the artist toiling away in this prison in the hopes of like reaching that sunrise maybe or rather attaching to it and i love that the end of the film has both of them standing in front of the sunrise so this symbolism to me is kind of yeah that's that's a good good and clear symbolism right there they escaped the artist's prison and they're in and looking at the sunrise now yeah i think the image is striking to me personally because i feel like the way the way it's framed it's almost like he's making and looking out at the sun but it's almost like not like he's trying to escape because he still wants to make the violin yeah. It's almost like the artist looks out and sees the sunlight, but they like they they then turn that longing and that looking into what they're making. Yeah. And, um, um, the the this woodcut, by the way, was made by Miyazaki's son, not Goro Miyazaki, but Keisuke Miyazaki, a professional engraver. Uh, also, fun fact. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a really interesting fun fact, actually. Well, uh. Yeah, yeah I was talking about easy symbolism. If we, if you guys <laughs> don't have anything to add for the easy ones, let's get in, let's get into the more complicated ones. Right, I had two I wanted to present, yeah. or one big one, I guess. So I was thinking about um, we understand like Seiji's and uh, Shizuku's uh, journey and growth throughout the film, but there are constantly like parallels drawn to the Baron and his lost lover, as well as to the old man and his lost lover. Like we've we've alluded kind of to the idea of the old man and his lost lover, as in we like look back at the past in some way but i kind of want to understand these parallels of like these these lovers torn apart because obviously these two are gonna be torn apart for a while but not in this way where we never where they will never meet again but in this way where they have promised marriage and and stuff 
I, th I think we've already like sort of explained it over the course of the cast. Like first of all, there's the whole "it's not that easy" uh, mm -hmm. uh, idea, um, w which like uh, and the whole like maturing thing. Like find that's where like the drama is is in that like not having that uh, c catharsis, um, and, and 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 like the interesting way how like even before she knows the grandpa's story, she's already made a story that like parallels it. And I, I, I think it's um, like, I'm, I'm not personally, I don't really consider myself an artist, but like, I, 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 th I guess it's like part of like being an artist is like seeing those connections happening organically. Like life imitates art, imitates life. Um, mm. So like she was like inspired, obviously like by her, in a way by her own relationship with Seiji, but also like um, by the fairy tales she's read so far in which that might be a motif. And also in the um, uh, in in the uh, grandfather clock, which has that exact kind of motif, yeah, that which the, which the, the grandfather king... is uh, was fixing way before she entered the story, and yeah. like maybe part of the reason he like likes it and wants to show it off is it because it resonates with him because he had that story. So in that way, like it, it that that's how it, it it's again about like creativity and where inspiration comes from. Also, like the fundamental, like building blocks of like a tragic romance, right? The dwarven king can never be with the elven queen, uh, the fairy queen, or whatever. Um, the idea is that this divide, uh, uh, where they have to part, the lovers have to part, creates kind of the romantic backdrop that enables like this wonderful sense of romanticism to it, right? The, the narrative that it is. Yeah, the like idea it's only, that like, those two romance without from, yearning yeah. is just a slice of life. Yeah, I mean, it just works, you know, and that's not what this is about. Like, they they have to, like, live their lives and find their ways and find back together again afterwards. That's both, like, the tragedy of it, but also the beauty of it, like, the, 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 the romance itself. Like, what would have been, like, a more, like, compelling romance story than, like, the old man and his lover parting right before the war, then the war comes, and then after years they find each other again and they can re reunite the baron and his fiance. Well, but it didn't happen, yeah, you know. That Life's not that yeah, easy. Yeah, I, I think that's why the marriage is extra potent because if we understand it, like, well, if we actually like, just look at it on the face of it, they met each other like upwards of like four times basically, and then after two months, they did, decided to get married, and like they they almost never went on a date. They never like did anything, but because of that that longing, that like feeling of separation, but ultimately like their their hard work and like their dreams will bring them back together is like something more powerful than uh, anything else. Yeah, it's, it's, all, it's part of the reason why I think it's kind of tongue in cheek. Like they're, they're still uh, it, like, they should know that again, life's not that easy that they like making that kind of commitment at that age is kind of, um, so, so it feels like part of like, they're, they're still not completely mature. They're still, they're still so. kids. They still have these uh, idealistic dreams, but like that's, part of like what m like makes them who they are and like uh, that's part of that gem inside them that that purity so actually miyazaki says something about wholesomeness in in starting point uh, uh, about this film because he talks about like what how like what you're saying right now that this kind of is tongue in cheek i think he himself as a writer, sees this as tongue-in-cheek, but like he insists that he is this middle-aged man who's like kind of jaded by life, wants to have this movie be like filled with this wholesomeness of these young people determining their future and deciding that this is how it will go. And uh, he, he says, and I quote, it's easy to cynically declare that wholesomeness is a fragile concept, only possible if protected by others. Even so, it seems to me that it ought to be possible to express it in an even stronger, overwhelmingly powerful way. How wonderful the quality of wholesomeness is. Yeah, like, and, and this is de definitely like a, a wholesome film. Um, I, I think it might also like be a, a, as good a transition as any to, to talk about like the character arc at the center of the film. Um, yeah. Yeah. And and I think like related a bit to creation, the process of like finding your craft and creation, because that's so, so interlinked. Yeah. Um, so like watching this, I, I can kind of understand if people who really love most uh, Ghibli films would kind of be like weirded out by this movie. Not just because of like, uh, as mentioned way at the beginning, like the poster and this, oh, 
get ready to go into a magical world with this cat guy. No, that's not what it's about. But also, like, it's um, it's it's really like un uh, um, unorthodox in its uh, in its structure and spe- specifically like the the arc at the center of the film, um, because like. The whole point of the movie is she doesn't really have a character. She has to invent one for herself uh, b- by yeah. the end. Um, like I mentioned before, like, yeah, it establishes the normal world, but there's no, like, big thing that happens to um, Shizuku. That, there's that, no that conflict she, she doesn't, that is there. Yeah, there's no, yeah, that there's no uh, external uh, conflict. Like, the guy she likes likes her back. There's some, like, uh, love triangle in, in the middle, but it's mostly resolved relatively quickly just with some lingering feelings about it um the, 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 like interestingly if if you really look at it like from the start to the end of the film very little about her direction has changed like at the start of the film she was having fine grades she was going to graduate she was going to go to high school uh and pr- uh, probably do something creative uh it's, it's not sure and at the end of it She's still going to, like, graduate high school. Like, no really big thing ha- happens. I mean, I mean she, she she gets the guy, but, like... Um, so externally, not much has happened. But it's because m- most of this movie's drama happens internally. It's inside her. It's her own sense of uh, of, uh, of NUI, of um, of be- being, like, uh, oh, stuck we. in her ways. Wa- <laughs> NUI? Is that how you oh, pronounce it? Are we... <laughs> it's Are a we? Word, I think. Shit! Can we can we cut that out? No. No. <laughs> you will That's have embarrassing. To live with that. <laughs> Are we? That's right. It's a French loan word. Okay. I've most. Uh, I, I'm a well-read guy. I'm not a well-spoken one. Um, <laughs> it's fine. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, um. Yeah. Are we? <laughs> her, 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 yeah. Anyway, that's what I get for trying out fancy words. Um, yeah, to just be, be, being like so, sort of stuck in this everyday life, uh, the, this feeling of things starting to transition w- without like her being in uh, control of it. And of course, she, when she meets Seiji and finds him so interesting and inspiring and like, oh my God, he knows all about what he wants to do. He's, he's, he's like becoming an, an artist. He's, uh, I'm feeling left behind. That's where the drama is. It's in her internal struggle to find something to do, to find that creative spark and, and use it and to stand up for herself. Like she stands up for herself to, to her parents, um, to, to, to her family. And they're like, this is something important to me that I have to do, uh, which is something she would not at all have done at the start of the film. So, yeah. so, in, so in that way, that is a drama, but it's so um, internal and so like specific to to this sort of uh, of character, this creative type who hasn't been creative yet. That's uh, that that might like make it like less universal in a way, le- less accessible to. to I mean, means- yeah, but also I think it's universal in the sense that this is the formative time when she decides what her future will be. Like, yeah. at the start of the film, we cannot be sure if she's a creative type yet. She she, she seems to have kind of gotten roped into translating the song. And <laughs> yeah, she's kind of un, un, uncertain about, like, how she's doing it and or if it's any good or whatever. And, and, like, by the end of the film, or rather the middle of it, rather, the, she finds, well, I, I want to write. I want to see if I can do it. I want to test this. Yeah, And this yeah. is kind of the important thing, like, the formative moment where her future crystallizes. Yeah, and uh, and it gets back to um, you, you. You talked about like the the whole uh, feminist angle of like uh, just like uh, not being carried around by a guy, and how th- 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 there's obviously this like sort of tension between the tradcore, let's get married and be traditional artisans, versus like uh, the the girl fi- finding her own. Um, th- th- I think there's an even deeper thing here where like the structure itself of the film rejects external conflict and focus very focuses very much on like uh, the uh, internal emotion and how that translates into relationships with a, which is a which is kind of a more feminine thing if you see like external conflict as male coded and uh, and like internal uh, emotional stakes as more uh, feminine so in that way like uh, f- a feminist film theory would definitely be on the side of like yeah this is an uh, empowered uh, female main character even if, like, she's, like, like her whole 
Ark is a transition from passive to active character. And that doesn't mean that, like, her direction in life changes or, like, any, like, dramatic loss happens. It just means that she's a different person by the end, and that's enough. Is he a manic pixie dream boy? <laughs> mm, he debatable. He doesn't do just play the violin. <laughs> he, doesn't do, no, he doesn't do anything weird enough. Like playing yeah, he's not quirky enough. enough. He doesn't have purple hair. <laughs> mm, he only has, like, slightly blue, but that's enemy standard. <laughs> yeah, it is. I'm pretty sure it's, he's not coded as, like, coloring his hair. Like, yeah. you know, that's, he's not a delinquent. Oh, he is. <laughs> <laughs> uh. yeah um but but that is kind of an argument but i i i don't know i think um he exists not just for her uh character arc oh yeah he's doing he's, his own thing yeah. he's absolutely doing his own thing like exactly. he, he that, that's the whole point oh, of his character is he does his yeah, own thing. exactly he's like oh i'm gonna fuck off to italy for 10 years by the way <laughs> <laughs> just thought i'll let you know man <laughs> Man, he sh- he should have talked to her at the library. They could have had a like whole thing going on. Man. Yeah, I like that because he's presented originally as um, this kind of like like I said, almost snide, villainous little character. But then uh, he opens up to her. And he's like, uh, "Yeah, I'll go. Well, I'm going to Italy. You know, like I'm I've planned out my life into the foreseeable future, and I'm just gonna go for it." And then we also learn that like. He read the library books that she was reading, so he read a bunch, hoping that she would see his name. And he was always too embarrassed to like confront her about it. He's always kind of maybe had a little crush on her, and there was yeah, this it's little so, it's thing. so adorable that detail. Yeah, so he he's 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 just as like uh, he's just as um frightened a bit as she is. So it exactly. kind of comes and, around, and it also like it also puts them on an even playing field. Like he hmm. had this imagination of her. And, and like this image of her uh, in, in his mind, and he was he he was like infatuated with her, like uh, with with how like I I can imagine like uh, her sitting there reading all these books at the library, uh, like she, she would like seem interesting to him in the same way that he seemed interesting to her for for like what he did, uh, like uh, what what his hobby is and what yeah. So, so, so and of course we get the beautiful equal. scene where they do it, and that's like. That's like a real like deep soul bonding moment for the two of them. Where like yeah. they're like stripping back the layers, like they're both kind of like embarrassed a bit. But yeah. like she continues singing and they they have such a great moment. And that's like such a beautiful use of the song. It's basically the equivalent of like a, a couple flights uh a couple flying in uh, in Miyazaki works. Yeah, yeah, pretty like much. Like it's that moment. What what a yeah. fantastic little scene, by the way. It just it just makes me smile every time I see it, when the, the, when they start singing and and like it, we we don't really get much context for like the grandpa and his pals. They're just they're they just, just introduce in, themselves yeah. as the music friends, and it's like, <laughs> oh, I want music friends in my life. One of them is voiced by Kondo, by the way. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> just a director cameo. Yeah. Uh, I. Th- I think maybe it's uh, about like time before we close this out to talk about the elephant in the room, which talk is about exactly Kondo himself. Kondo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the the um the the movie get like f- hits a bit different, especially the arc about uh her uh, almost overworking herself and like the uh the pride and joy and uh, despair of the creative process. Yeah. The when hard work that. of w- labor of the art, right? You need to put yeah. in the hard work. It's kind of like a quiet the movie, kind of romanticizes it too. Like you need to do this work to fulfill yourself as an artist to even see what you can do. Yeah, because uh, uh, yeah, Kondo uh, passed away. Uh, I think three years after this movie came out. Yeah, they were uh, still working yeah. on uh, Mononoke. Exactly, and he died from, you know, he had an aneurysm because of overwork, because of consistent overwork. His health, in general, while he was working with Studio Ghibli, was never great, but like Miyazaki, in in, in a couple of interviews where he talked about it, mentioned that uh, Kondo always seemed like the person who would, you know, even if he ends up in a hospital, he would always get back up, he would always come back and work again with them. And so Miyazaki never felt all that terrible about giving him a bigger workload and uh, Takahara as well. And Kondo himself seemed to really, you know, also take on these bigger workloads. Although at some point he said Takahara was trying to kill me. So uh, 
<laughs> oh, <laughs> damn. <laughs> that that reads the, different today. <laughs> obviously, at the time, more or less jokingly, but it's, uh, there's like an anecdote of like, that is being described of Miyazaki, Takahara, and another uh, member of the studio standing around, and Suzuku-san, the, the, the producer, came to Taka, uh, t- came to the group and said, well, Takahara-san, you killed him, right? And Takahara just sadly nodding. And that's a really fucking sombering like, feeling there, that we have this intensely like important and relevant, like beautiful creative passion of animation, and we never really consider and really think about all the work that goes into it the japanese animation industry is a pathologically absolutely overworked industry it's, i think the industry with like the highest average number of work hours per week of any industry in all of japan and animators overworking and getting going to the hospital and dying is not a rare thing it happens from time to time yeah and and, 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 yeah. and we should be careful not to romanticize it uh, as well like, like you 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 might hear the story and and, and, and like f- find some like deeper meaning with it I, I i don't think there's a deeper meaning with it if like if if there wasn't this uh c- culture of overwork if, if it wasn't so routine to just overwork yourself to the point that, that it was terrible for your health and then taking a brief rest and getting back to it like we would have more condo movies and like after after watching this movie uh, a couple of times and after like really diving deep into it and like really seeing all the merits of it, it just makes it all the more tragic that we never got to see him flourish even more because this is one of the like most impressive debut feature films uh, for a director that, that, I, that I can think of. Yeah. And mm. just the monumental loss of a, of that this uh, really like inspiring creative is just it's it's a tragedy, and e- e- even like even aside from the like loss of life itself. Yeah, uh-huh. I think the sad thing about it though is that the movie kind of enforces those ideas in a almost like too fitting of a way, in which Kondo overworked himself because, uh, like like it or not, that's just like the uh, the atmosphere of the industry. Like we were saying that Miyazaki wanted to retire at sixty, but he's still making movies up until now. Yeah, like, about that. Yeah, yeah, he actually like, um, the the whole in the whole industry and the whole way that it, it's it's pushed is about this like insane workload and these insane hours, and you just rather burn out or you just keep going. Like you're just a person who's hard enough to handle it, and you just keep on plowing through. And like that's just kind of like how they view it. Like Miyazaki just happens to be a crazy person who will put in all that effort and somehow isn't dead yet. Yeah. And the movie reflects Kondo's work ethic as mm. Miyazaki describes it in, in, in an eulogy that she gave like at the at the funeral of uh, Kondo. Miyazaki talked about how stubborn um, Kondo was in life, that he was someone who would stick with a sinking ship until the end and not like go off of the sinking ship. Whereas Miyazaki is a person who himself, he said, he's way too impatient. He would leave the ship and seek another ship like constantly. He would like, uh, as a creator, be impatient and quick and fast and so on. But Kondo was someone who like stuck with it and who is seen constantly toiling like one on one scene for a long, long, long time until it was finished and constantly coming back from whatever health issues he suffered and uh, returning to, you know, the sinking ship in this sense, which in this metaphor would be its health as well as like his work that really seem to have made up his purpose. And yeah, this informs the film in a way. We see Shizuko really overworking herself to the point of being overly tired without sleep and neglecting her exams and so on. And I think this was a kind of a wake-up call for Miyazaki and all of Digi, uh, D- Ghibli, not Digi, afterwards, <laughs> where Miyazaki, it, it, at least it's said that Kondo's uh, un, uh, t- uh, early death informed his decision to retire um, after Mononoke, well, he said he would retire, but he didn't. Yeah. But yeah. instead, all of the Ghibli production schedule really slows down after Mononoke Hime, where instead of um, a film every one or two years, or a production cycle of a film which is one to two years, we now have films like taking three to four years or even longer. Uh, just and ensuring, I think it was introduced in Studio Ghibli afterwards that like between two film projects, there's a thick six month break where there's no work is done. Yeah. And, well, 
I'm glad that in Studio Ghibli they've now adjusted kind of their labor conditions um, a bit more so that they will hopefully in, in the future have and, and since then have had much better work relations going on there, which is also, by the way, kind of fitting as uh, I think we talked about this very early on that Takahara Miyazaki were both leaders of the animators union back in Toei animation days when they worked there and they did a long lasting impact on Toei animations like labor regulations, which today leads to the fact that Toei is considered one of the most like labor worker friendly uh, studios in, in, in the anime industry. But yeah, so this yeah. is kind of an irony, I suppose, how this I mean, happened that, in Studio I Ghibli. Mean, that as well as, um, I think Kyoto Animation is also one of the studios known for its, uh, oh, yeah. for, for, for its, uh, healthy workplace. Yeah. And, and, and it also goes to show that like you, the, like these sorts of working conditions and this sort of culture is not necessary in, to create a great art. Uh, or, or or commercial art or whatever you, uh, you you want to make, and even if it was like necessary to make this, like as much as we obviously all love Studio Ghibli, uh, I I would say nothing is worth that. Like no creative work is wor- worth worth uh, a life in that way. So what I think is still important and really necessary of this film is the film while kind of giving it a romantic vibe, also shows you that, you know, artistry is not some magic where you, without having to put in any work, just have a talent and realize it because you're a genius and then everything is fine. But no, the movie does show you that it's hard work, that it is lifelong decisions that you have to make, that it is a time commitment, like an effort commitment, a health commitment as well. And I think it's good that this film at least in this context, also shows us like the, the 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 how hard labor is, even creative labor, because a lot of like culture. And there's a wonderful Renegade cut video on this uh, where he actually talks about Whisper of the Heart and like the romanticization of like the 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 depressed artist is, is, is his topic of video, where like many people like fetishize like unhealthy artists as saying like well the the reason that artists are unhealthy is like the reason why the art is so good like the depressed artists they're depressed but this is why the art is good like the bipolar artist only like when they take medication their art gets worse like this this narrative exists and i think it's presupposing like a very unhealthy thing which is that art is not intensive labor but like the magic product of some genius mind and this yeah, and film it, very it's, much it's another contributes thing that it's another thing in a positive that way. change in adaptation right like um, it, you mentioned yeah, yeah. like the whole subplot of like the exams and the sacrifice yeah. she has to make. It's not that easy, exactly. It was changed. So this film is one that more honestly depicts the labor of an artist. And it's really, I mean, I, I want to say it's ironic that uh, a Kondo who really made this film about the hard labor of artistry died from the hard labor of artistry. Um, and it's just, I guess, really sad to evaluate this film in this context i I wouldn't say it's ironic i'd say it's almost like tragically predictable that like this this mindset led here yeah and it's you 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 can sort of like when 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 you hear like uh, miyasaki's sadness about the anime industry like maybe like obviously a big part of it is like he he longs for like the traditional and the uh and, and more like pure artistry I think maybe part of it is also that part, like how people get overworked, not and not even to like uh, complete their artistic vision, but like just to make products, like the mass production of it today might yeah, be in, a part of it. In the eulogies, both Miyazaki and Takahara thanked Kondo for how he made these films possible and said sorry to him. And Takahara went into detail explaining how, you know, exactly what you just said, right? That, that, despite of how like Takahara talked about how he intended to make Kondo's talent flourish by giving him these tasks by bringing out the artist in him right but that the thought hurts him so much that in his attempts to make him flourish he might have like he has taken years of his life that's very heavy stuff but you know what Uh, I think I think this is a movie that we should celebrate for the legacy of Kondo that it leaves behind. And yeah. I just want to mention that at his funeral, 
because he was such a respected person in the industry, over 400 people showed up, including other like uh, well-known creators. For example, Hideaki Anno showed up at his funeral and like also paid his respects. And so many people were really influenced by him and like, had seen his work, admired his work, and like, he has contributed to countless wonderful films. So let's remember his legacy, despite the tragic circumstances of the industry that, that and his own yeah. work ethic that have led him, you know, to an early death. Yeah, and I, and I, I want more people to to watch this movie and like to uh, appreciate it on its uh, on its own merits and not just uh, as compared to like the fantastic masterpieces of Studio Ghibli because it really does have like a, a lot of interesting merits and a unique identity within the uh, the canon of Studio Ghibli. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, I know plenty of people who uh, this is their favorite Ghibli outright. Yeah, and and it was a huge hit actually when when it came out. Like it, mm. it, it was uh, as uh, <laughs> Ghibli tradition, the highest grossing movie in Japan of that year. Yeah. So it's it's not just a curiosity. It is a film that has uh, touched hearts and minds uh, throughout the ages. Like and like st- is still like it, it, we were joking about like the lo-fi hip hop thing, but like I think it's saying that the imagery uh, and artistry of the film like still. Uh, is evocative uh, and and like reused and remixed uh, to this day. I'm I, I I'm grateful that uh, that we got this movie, uh, even as I am like depressed and kind of like angry that we we lost uh, this artist who I just learned it wasn't the lady. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so like he 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 went before his time, like. I I just can't imagine like what sorts of fantastic works might have been in his future, like if that that gem got even more polished. Yeah, I mean he was supposed to inherit the Ghibli legacy from from Miyazaki and Takahata. They were like really <laughs> grooming him to be the next one, uh, the next big name of their studio. Yeah, well, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. All right. Um, so at this point, it kind of feels awkward to transition into the outro, but I think it's time. I think it's yeah. time <laughs> to say the the usual end things, which is that, of course, uh, to everyone listening, thanks for listening to the Nazi Cast. You should also check out our Discord server if you want to, you know, discuss the film or anything else with us. Lot of lots of anime talk. Hopefully, in the future, if you all join and contribute plenty. And consider supporting our, you know, mic quality and uh, drum roll. Imagine drum roll, not a real drum roll. Um, the 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 ability for us to set up uh, putting our podcast onto iTunes, RSS feeds, and so on, like to, so you can, at your convenience, find it in your podcasting apps. Because that has hosting costs, and we want them. We want to kind of cover <laughs> them to make the service uh, available to everyone. Um, that you can do on our Patreon, on patreon.com slash Nausicast with a double A. But the links are also, as always, all in the description. The next project we're going to find ourselves in is a, a huge and in- intimidating film. Maybe the biggest film out of Studio Ghibli, aside from maybe Spirited Away. And it is Princess Mononoke or Mononoke Hime. So look forward to that. I That's know I'm looking... One. I know I'm looking forward to maybe 50 papers, uh, like two <laughs> books and like 200 pages of turning points. So yeah, <laughs> that's going to be a fun one. Hopefully we're not going to crack the four hour mark, but no promises. <laughs> what are you talking yeah, we'll about? Like that's the goal. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, see you all in the next one and goodbye. Sayonara. Yeah. Goodbye. That was very reluctant. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Okay. Can I redo that then? No, we're not <laughs> redoing no. this. We're leaving it all in. This is yeah. what you did to us. Bye. Uh, it, go chase a cat somewhere sometime. Have an adventure. Exactly. And tell us about it in the comments down below. Rate, like, and subscribe. Hit the bell. Hit that fucking bell. (laughs) What an amazing (laughs) outro. (laughs) We nailed that.